What's up guys, it's Dollmatter here, and today we are going to be reacting to part two of the World of War Tanks Chieftain uh, crossover, I guess you could call it, collaboration. Um, although apparently his full-time job, he actually does work for the company that owns World of Tanks. Somebody had mentioned that on the other video. Uh, so I guess, I don't know if you can consider this a crossover or him just doing his job. Um, so yeah, he's apparently a historical advisor there. So anyway, uh, this is Inside the Chieftain's Hatch, M50 Part 2. Reacted to Part 1 earlier in the week. Uh, obviously, you know, the M50 was added to the game. And my camera keeps zooming in and going in and out of focus for some reason. Uh, but yeah, so this is Part 2. And uh, yeah, link to the original video down below. Let's jump into it. Welcome back to the wilds of Southern Nevada. We were playing around on Battlefield Vegas's M50. This is the core part two. If you missed part one, just go to the link below and get yourself caught up. Otherwise, onwards. And you can see I'm standing in the loader's hatch. This is a oval loader's hatch. Most of the M50s by now would have had them, although there were some M50s still were built off the line with the older split hatch if they had a hatch at all. Of course, a lot of the early 75mm turrets had no loader's hatch, and they created a field modification that you can install. It was a kit, basically. But loader's hatch here. Other things on the outside of the turret, well, of course, you got the French-made smoke grenade launchers. If you look at the back, you're going to oh, see the cool. I didn't realize fan they had those housing for the tanks. ventilator in the bustle slash counterweight, two radio antennae. On the front of the turret, your spotlight control from inside, a vein sight, two machine guns. The Israelis love giving everybody machine guns. It seemed like an M5 half track with like six machine guns scattered around the outside. They don't have many men in Israel. So in order to make up the numbers a little bit, they give everybody a machine gun. Why not? So we can see here, we've got a caliber 50 on the pintle front and center in between the TC and the loader. And there is a caliber 30. Uh, actually, it's a 7.62 uh, converted just for the commander. A lot of Israeli vehicles, you will sometimes see another caliber 50 mounted on the gun tube. And there is a mount just forward of the mount lip, but that is not for a caliber 50. That is for a spotlight for fighting at night. So that is so an basically extra spotlight. it for the outside. Now it's time to go in. Once you get in, it's cozy, but definitely sittable. Uh, the basket does seem to be a little bit higher than other Shermans I've been in, possibly because of the large amount of underfloor stowage. I'll get back in a second. Although I do note that they were nice enough to put cushioning inside here for your head. Now, of course, you are supposed to be wearing a helmet at the same time. And the Israelis use all sorts of helmets from the American World War II style through to you'll even find some Russian style helmets. I think they were actually made in Czechoslovakia, but they're sort of the, the ribs made of uh, spongy leather. Not all M3 turrets were built with a pistol port. So if they didn't have a pistol port, one would eventually be added. And uh, yeah, it's called a pistol port. In reality, you'd be using it to Floyd, whatever you wanted out there, such as shell casings. Back up. Come around to the left That's side. You cool. see stowage for your small arms, your personal defense weapon, which, of course, being in Israel, is an Uzi. And there's mounting points scattered around for the crew. Periscope, fully traversable and elevation. Uh, obviously, a good thing if you're buttoned up. Dome light to the front, the control point for that spotlight I mentioned earlier, simple toggle switch on and off. There is a handle that you can get. It looks a bit like a 1911 handle. It's, it's old, goes back to World War II, basically. And you'll note the power connector this comes and select, uh, connects up into here. Coaxial machine gun. Uh, it is a 1919. It has been rechambered to 7.62 NATO. And this was done by the Israelis. There's Israeli uh, Hebrew markings on the side. Solenoid fired. There is a single box of ammunition directly underneath the coaxial. So it kind of goes out, around, and uh, up from the bottom left. Stowage for an additional two boxes further down underneath. Uh, actually, I think you get more than two boxes. I'm looking at it. Correction, an additional at least five boxes. And then we come around to the gun with the travel lock for elevation and the breech opening handle, massive breech opening handle. 
Just bring it up, around, lock it into place. Now remember, this gun was originally designed for operation with an autoloader on the MX-13. The Israelis had a look at it, and they decided, though, not to go with an autoloader and just keep it a manually loaded gun. Uh, unlike, let's say, the Egyptians, who put the AMX-13 FL-10 turret on top of their Shermans. Ammunition scattered around. Well, depends on where you read it, it looks like, because I've seen some books say 62 rounds, 9 on the left, 3 on the basket floor, and 25 on each side under the turret basket. This tank doesn't have that, that I can see. I see stowage for 5 on the left, nothing on the basket, but it does retain the two underfloor ammo bins for 25 rounds a piece. And you can see- So I wonder if that's because, <clears throat> I remember in his, the last video, he was talking about how like a lot of these tanks, the Israelis bought them and then modified them. I wonder if, you know, when you're when you're reading up on these, if it's basically that individual tank, because, you know, I'm assuming based on what he was saying in his earlier video or in the first video, that a lot of these tanks were, you know, custom modified and therefore would, not be the same, right? Like, would no two tanks be exactly the same? Is that what's happening here? Maybe I'm wrong? I don't know. See, they're not small ammo storage bins, so five across, five down on each side. So obviously, you get the ones at the far side, you got to spin the turret over the back deck. The ammunition types available were HE, AP, and APCBC. Now, the latter supposedly capable of penetrating about 90 millimeters of armor, sloped to 30 degrees at 1,000 meters. The gun was theoretically capable also of firing heat and sabo. However, I haven't been able to confirm Israeli use of those types of ammunition from this gun. The ammunition is not small. So as you can see, once you pull it out, you have barely enough room to put the projectile behind the breech and to give it a good push in. Now, the recoil guard is huge, but really does not get in your way at all. So kudos to them, they designed that one well. But the gun is capable of being loaded at all elevations. It is very close, but it can be done. Uh, otherwise, it's a semi-automatic system, so you slam the round in the first time. After that, uh, every time you fire, it auto-ejects and you move, just load on to the next round. The recoil card is big, as you would imagine, but it actually doesn't interfere with the loading process at all. So I've got plenty of room for my fist to slam it in. So that's it for the loader side, really. I'll just mention the, the junction box. Looks very familiar if you're an American AFE crewman. So uh, somebody who's like been in a tank before, why is he using his fist, not his palm? Is he like worried about his fingers getting caught or something? Just seems like weird to just punch it instead of just pushing it. I mean, I guess it's not really that big of a difference, but... Uh, the recoil guard folds out of the way very nicely. You just slide back. One small part folds down. The rest folds forward out of the way. Gives you a lot of room to wander around inside the back of the turret. So that said, next up, TC side. All right, so come over to the right-hand side of the turret. I've put the recoil guard back up just to simulate the lack of space. And the TC has two seats. He has an unbuttoned seat so he can sit comfortably uh, whilst observing the battlefield. And he has a buttoned up seat, a little bit lower behind and unfortunately removed from the vehicle. Plus, I am not sitting on it. However, I will note that he doesn't actually have a whole hell of a lot of room because I'm sitting on the gunner seat. The backrest would be here. So you can see his backrest you know, his seat is here. He only has this much room for the gunner's backrest. You've pretty much got to sort of straddle one leg each side of the gunner. And just be careful with your left leg because the recoil guard doesn't go down sufficiently far to cover it. One thing I've noticed about a lot of these tanks is you could not be like a really big guy and be these tanks. Like I feel like if you were like a six foot eight, six foot nine guy, you know, and like well built, you would not fit in a fucking tank. They're definitely for like smaller dudes, like average sized guys and smaller. Which is probably a little bit disconcerting. As you start at the back of the turret, uh, I do note a couple of mounting points for flashlights and whatnot. The radios are mounted more or less in the same place as they always have been. The ducting for the ventilator goes to the very far back of the bustle. 
but you will see that the counterweight is literally a counterweight. It is solid metal, and there's not much extra internal volume created by the addition on the back. Intercom set, your J-Box, uh, again, post-war American style. The cupola. So again, M50s were built with either the older split hatch cupola or the single piece direct vision cupola, the latter, of course, being far preferred. Uh, however, uh, like most late model M50s, we have the single piece cupola, but after the M50s left frontline service and they started being used as fortifications and bunkers, basically, uh, the M48s were also entering service to replace the M50s. The Israelis thought those were really, really tall vehicles. They aren't because they've got a big cupola, armored cupola for the caliber 50 for the TC. So these became, these single piece Sherman hatches became in high demand as the Israelis would remove the M48 cupola, replace it with the Sherman single piece. As you move a little bit further around, you have a commander's override for the power traverse. I suspect, can't confirm, but I suspect from the wiring that this is a control toggle for the spotlight, which is mounted on top of the gun. Other than that, it's a simple enough TC seat. I can't really complain about it, other than the fact that there is no legroom. Uh, but it will otherwise do the job. So next we move forward to the gunner's place. Gunner's not doing too badly. Um, I mean, yeah, my legs are a little long, but that's typical for me in an older tank. Certainly it's how very tall is he? for me. So as well, uh, how tall is he? Cause this is what I'm wondering. Like, you know, you see him cramped in all these tanks and I'm like wondering like, is he like a relatively tall guy? Like, is he like six, two, six, three, somewhere around there? Or is he like an average height, like five, eight, five, nine guy? That is. Yeah. Cause, cause like, <laughs> I feel like he should, <clears throat> he should like mention that in every video. Yeah. By the way, I'm like, I, yeah. Here's the thing is like, yeah, if, if he's tall, then it just seems like he's bragging about his height or something. I don't know. I want to know how tall he is, though, because then that gives me like some reference for how big this is. Where to start? I guess we'll start off with the gun itself. Now, it's often stated that the CN7550 is a copy of the Panther's KWK43. I have found nothing to corroborate this at all. Yes, it's a 75 millimeter gun. So it's the one on the original Sherman. And, you know, there's obviously no cor correlation there. Uh, the Chamber size is different. You cannot put German ammunition in the French gun or vice versa. As near as we can tell, the closest that happened is that the French studied the Panther's gun, maybe got a couple of hints or tips, but otherwise it's an independent development. As you look forward, you're going to see, you know, again, several things here. So, for example, the gunner's quadrant here for indirect fire to use in conjunction with the azimuth indicator on the right. You can see the large bolts that I'd mentioned, which hold the entire gun assembly on. And you can look through and you can see the trunnions well forward uh, on either side of the gun. And you can, you can see the, the way that the mantle is configured. There would ordinarily be a telescopic sight here. It has been removed from the vehicle, unfortunately. We don't know why. Curse whoever that was. But you will also note that they have modified the gunner's periscope to have the connecting rod go through the original mantle port to connect to the main gun. So it is also still possible to fire the main and coaxial ammunition by use of the periscope, which has a unity optic on the left-hand side and a small telescope on the right-hand side. So you head forward, you can fully see with all of the advantages that you get of a periscopic sight that you can observe without being so obvious, unlike a telescopic sight where you have to expose most of your turret in order to see anything. He has a junction box of its own. Once the traverse lock is released, traverse is conducted either by manual traverse in the traditional manner, or you disengage the clutch and there is a power traverse option by use of the handle down at the bottom. It's an oil gear power traverse system here. And just next to the uh, power traverse control handle, you're gonna see the main power box. So there is a big toggle here for turret power. You can also toggle on and off the coaxial machine gun and the vents. Elevation on the left-hand side is, again, the same sort of control handle with a clutch to select elevation with uh, manual control or power control. However, I see no indication that a stabilizer has been retained. Maybe it was, and it's now no longer in the vehicle. 
getting good information on an M50, at least in English, is surprisingly difficult. Other than that, again, more protection for the gunner. And uh, he just needs to be careful to remember to leave the TC enough room. But again, he's the gunner. He's going to be leaning forward and to the right. He's going to be leaning into the gunner's periscope. So he's not going to interfere with the TC quite as much as perhaps he might think. Finally, of course, the last thing you do is you fire a round, which you have a couple of choices. So there's a coaxial machine gun button down by your foot. Uh, there is an electrical trigger or a... Right, normally that doesn't happen in these things. Might be a good idea to get out of here. What just happened there? Did that... You have a couple of choices. So there's a coaxial machine gun button down by your foot. Uh, there is an electrical trigger or a... Right, normally that doesn't happen in these things. Might be a good idea to get out of here. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure if that was a skit or if like he actually broke something. What happened? Like, I don't think it actually fired, right? Because there was no round there. It's not a live tank, is it? Now I am just skipping right over the bow gunner's position because it's a bow gunner's position. Unlike the Firefly conversions, the Israelis felt no need to dispense with the bow gun in order to allow additional ammunition. Although as I'm looking at it, I see that the ammunition on the right-hand side of the tank is actually stowed with the points facing to the rear, unlike the left-hand side where it's facing forward, which actually makes a bit of sense because if you think about it, the loader has rotated 180 degrees in order to access it. However, after a few years, it was decided to cull the bow gunner's position because the Israeli army is somewhat manpower strapped and it was deemed more efficient that if you took the fifth man from four tanks, you could then man a fifth tank. So what's really more important, uh, five bow gunners or an entirely new additional tank? So that's why we're not really bothering the bow gunner's position. You've seen it before. Driver's side, again, this is a small hatch Sherman. You've seen me get out of it at combat speed. It's actually not that bad to get out of. Simple, single swing over hatch, no difference at all to the Grizzly that we filmed before. Now, they changed the engine. They did not change the transmission. The transmission is still your manual transmission, synchronized except for the first gear and as I recall, reverse, but don't quote me on that. Left-hand side, well, you got your control box, master power for the hull, master power for the turret, and the jump start connector, should you require a slave start. Left hand side, we note we do have a spare headlight and your dashboard, which has been suitably converted for operation with your ammeters, oil pressure, oil temperature, fuel level. Your light switch are the earlier World War II, well, mid middle World War II type, really. The, the very early ones were a, few, were a pull out. Fuel tank selector for your gauge, so if you know which gauge you're looking at. Panel lights as a power outlet. High water temperature, warning lights. There's only two warning lights, water temperature and oil pressure. And that's pretty much it. You come down, the seat of course will elevate and depress because you're driving head out or head down. As I'm driving head down, the periscope will be directly in front of me. There is an auxiliary periscope mounted directly to the front as well. So vision is not going to be a problem. Footrest on the left hand side, there is a, a clutch, reasonably light. No brake, of course, because the brakes are the two tillers. You pull back the two tillers, and there is a foot pedal which locks them in place if you wanted to use them as a parking brake. And, of course, on the right-hand side hmm. is an accelerator. So with those tillers, I don't, anyone who's ever run a rubber tire, it's kind of like running a rubber tire. Like, I guess rubber tire is just one, but it's forward and backwards. It's how you move forward and backwards. I'm guessing this is kind of similar. You just push forward to go forwards, pull back to go backwards. All right, so as I said, it's probably best we relocate before the local constabulary come to find out what that loud noise was. So to get going, we will turn on the master power to the hull. You see all the dials come to life. We have a low pr oil pressure light on, no surprise there. Turn on the preheater. Turn on the fuel cutoff. Down to start. Give it a bit of a prime. Let's see if that's necessary. Oh, fuel oil pressure is good. So we will ensure we are in neutral. 
clutch down, and let's see what happens if I push the big red button. It's loud. Time to get out of here. <laughs> he just fucking hit his head there. I would love to drive a tank at some point, that'd be so fun. Well, unsurprisingly, driving a Sherman is easy. Although I was a little bit surprised I was unable to get it into third on that slight upslope and keep it there. So Muran 300 M50s were totally converted by the Israelis, but by 1973 they were starting to get a little bit inviolable in the theater. So they started being converted to other roles, such as artillery. Not all of them, though. In the late 70s, about 30 to 50 of these M50s were handed over to an Israeli-backed militia force in Lebanon, the South Lebanon Army. And that explains the 016 mark I mentioned on the bow earlier, because they all had numbers welded to the front. So a fourth army for this vehicle. By the late 80s, though, they were also returned to Israel for future use. Other vehicles saw service as fortifications. About 50 were sent to Chile, where they had their 75 millimeter guns removed and replaced by 60 millimeter high velocity guns. They also had their Cummins engines replaced by Detroit diesel. If you are wondering why we were playing with a live cannon tank, well, that's because it is the business of Battlefield Vegas to have tanks available. Man, that. The, 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 how these tanks got around is just wild to me. Like, so it's made in America. They then sell it to the French, right? The French then sell it to the Israelis. The Israelis then sell it to the Chileans. They're just like, they're going everywhere. For people to rent out and shoot. It's like a hand me down clothing. So if like you're a massive. In the Vegas area, tell them we sent you. And who knows? Maybe they'll hook you up with something. So, anyway, that's it. Your M50. I hope you found it interesting and informative. Take care, and I'll talk to you on the next one. I'll talk to you on the next one. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, it fascinates me how much, how much like a lot of these vehicles get passed around. Um, you can, you can like almost. It, it, I don't even. It's just so weird because like. I wonder, do the Israelis not develop any of their own weapons? I thought they developed a lot of their own weapons, but I guess not. Uh, I know they developed some of them for sure. The Chileans, it doesn't surprise me that they're buying weapons. It kind of surprises me the French are, um, just because I, I know the French also develop a lot of their own weapons, because one of the things that was recently, uh, like a big controversy, if you can call it that, was that uh, Australia was supposed to be buying some submarines, I think it was, off of France, and then they uh, backed out of the deal like last minute and decided to buy a bunch off the Americans instead. Um, and then France and France was all mad at America and Australia about it. Um but yeah, it's like so weird to me that like, like this tank would be like bought by France, and then France is like, yeah, we're done with it. We'll sell it to the Israelis, and the Israelis are like, yeah, we're done with it. We'll sell it to the Chileans. Well, actually, first we're gonna give it to a militia group that we're backing in a foreign country. Then we're gonna get it back, and then we're gonna send it to Chile. So like this, some of these tanks have been like all over the world, um, and like like not all over the world, like all over the world, run by different people. It's like yeah, it's absolutely fascinating, but. Anyway, let me know what you think below. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.